Uh, again, that was the other evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, nice to see you all. Welcome to the University of the Ozarks. My name is Jeremy Wilhelm, and I am honored to serve here at the University of the Ozarks as its chaplain. And I welcome you to the uh, 2018 Cecil and Ruth Body Farmer Lecture, which is an endowed event that we are able to host annually here at the University of the Ozarks. We are grateful to the Farmer family for their support in making this annual event possible. This year, our guest is the Reverend and the Honorable Wendell Griffin of Little Rock, Arkansas. Re Reverend Griffin has served as the pastor of the New Millennium Church in Little Rock since its inception in 2009. New Millennium Church defines itself as an inclusive, progressive, and welcoming followers of Jesus Christ based on the belief that social justice is at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is also a circuit judge of the 5th Division, 6th District, Judicial District of the State of Arkansas, a position he has held since 2011. He is also the CEO of Griffin Strategic Consulting, a consulting practice focused on cultural competency and inclusion. He is a native of Delight, Arkansas, and a graduate of the University of Arkansas and at the University of Arkansas School of Law. Judge Griffin is a United States Army veteran, a 1975 graduate of the Defense Race Relations Institute, now the Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute, and was awarded the Army Commendation Medal for meritorious service in work concerning race relations and equal opportunity. Tonight's lecture is entitled Prophetic Hope, Religious Nationalism, and the Fate of Democracy in the 21st Century based off of his 2017 book, The Fierce Urgency of Prophetic Hope, which we will have copies for purchase on sale after the lecture. Please help me welcome Wendell Griffin. let alone it would challenge 
prospects for democracy in the United States. The 2016 presidential election should have changed our thinking and dispelled any concerns along those lines. As I mentioned in my book, The Fierce Urgence of Prophetic Hope, the election of Donald Trump forces us to confront, to confess, and to proclaim some inconvenient and some unavoidable truths. The Trump presidency was cheered and supported and selected by a voting bloc that identified as religiously identified people. They called themselves evangelical Christian conservatives. White Christian evangelicals, who I refer to as white Christian nationalists, voted for Mr. Trump in overwhelming numbers, by, and by and large, are the key voting constituency that produces election. Let me put it this way. Four out of every five persons who self-identified as white Christian conservatives voted for President Trump. Take away those votes, and the President of the United States would be the root man. And so we cannot deny the impact of religious nationalism on what democracy means any longer. Throughout these remarks, I will distinguish terms followers of Jesus, religion of Jesus, or disciples of Jesus, from the term Christians. I do not self-identify as a Christian. As I mentioned in the book, I do not do so because Christianity as a word religion is often identified with and has been seen complicit in colonialism, oppressive capitalism, imperialism, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, militarism, environmental injustice, xenophobia, and a host of other isms. That doesn't mean I'm down on Jesus, it just means I'm down on faith. And this point was confirmed afresh in the 2016 presidential election results. <clears throat> because I don't identify following Jesus, and that's my faith, with any of those hateful things, I don't use the term Christian. Now, people who use the term Christian can do so, but I choose not to use it to describe myself. I do that in uh, and the following example of Howard Thurman, who was the mentor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was his teacher at Morehouse. Uh, and so Howard Thurman said, uh, when he went to India, he was told by someone, we don't have a problem with Jesus, we have a problem with Christians. It's clear to me that Christian nationalists have given the religion of Jesus. That doesn't mean that Christian nationalism or religious nationalism is new to the United States. White evangelicals who may take offense at being identified as white nationalists may not want to admit it. But the truth is that the voting history of good white Christian evangelicals is functionally the same as white supremacists such as David Duke and Tom Roth, who are members of the KKK. That does not oftentimes come across in their minds. But check the voting records. Check the voting results. White Christian evangelicals and white Christian supremacists traditionally vote the same way. And the 2016 presidential election was not the first time it happened. What makes their voting behavior important for the U.S. as well as elsewhere around the world is the impact of white Christian nationalism on democracy. It's worth noting that white Christian nationalists were responsible for the election not only of President Donald J. Trump in 2016, but for the election of President Ronald Wilson Reagan in 1980. You recall, Ronald Wilson Reagan challenged the re-election of President James Earl Carter 
a white Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher who was committed to racial justice, gender equality, human rights, fairness for Palestinians, environmental protection, and worker justice. President Carter's personal and political record was dramatically different from that of Governor Reagan. But Reagan's candidacy was embraced by white Christian nationalists like Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, and James Robeson, who mentored a young religious student named Michael Huckabee. In the same way that white Christian nationalists looked past Donald Trump's misogyny and marital history during the 2016 presidential election, white Christian nationalists looked past Ronald Reagan's marital history. Remember, Ronald Reagan was divorced. He had been married to Jane Wyman before he married Nancy. Nancy was not his first or only marriage. And they looked past his ecumenism. And why Christian nationalists supported Donald Trump in 2016 for the same reasons that they supported Ronald Reagan in 1980. Because his positions on abortion, racial relations, affirmative action, welfare, and militarism agreed with their sense of patriarchy, religious nationalism, imperialism, and supremacy. Please remember that Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, Bill Bright, James Robeson did not support passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. That not only ended racial segregation, but also outlawed sex discrimination in employment. We would not have the Title VII protections for sex equality were it not for the 1964 Civil Rights Act. By the way, sex discrimination was added to the Civil Rights Act as an intent to defeat it. Most folks don't know this, but the opponents of the Civil Rights Act added sex to the Civil Rights Act believing that it would cause the Civil Rights Act not to pass. Good white Christian nationalists did not support Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his call for the end to U.S. military involvement in Southeast Asia in the same way that good Christian nationalists have not supported the calls to end the U.S. military engagement in Afghanistan. By the way, we have been in Afghanistan for 17 years now. The end is not in sight. Good white Christian nationalists opposed the war in Vietnam, or no, they opposed the war in poverty. They supported the war in Vietnam. They opposed the war in poverty. They opposed the Equal Rights Amendment. They opposed reproductive freedom for women and girls. They did not support Anita Hill during the confirmation hearings with Thomas, Thomas to the U.S. Supreme Court in the same way they did not support women who identified President Trump as a misogynist in 2016. Good white Christian nationalists have not supported LBGTQ equality. They cheered when President Trump condemned Colin Ka Kaepernick and other black and progressive white athletes for kneeling to the national anthem to demonstrate their concern in the same way that religious nationalists cheered when Tommy Smith and John Carlos were stripped of their gold medals during the 1968 Mexico Olympics. They won, you recall, they were they won first and third place in sprints. They were on the reviewing stand during the playing of the national anthem. They raised black gloved fists, and because they raised black gloved fists, they were stripped their medals. Fifty years later, Colin Strack Kaepernick has been stripped of the chance to play professional football. And the same mindset, the religious nationalists supported both. 
Religious nationalists did not oppose profiling of persons considered Muslims or salvations after the September 11 terrorist attack on New York City. They haven't supported Planned Parenthood. They didn't support passage of the Affordable Care Act, and in the states where religious nationalists are strongest, expanding Medicaid to cover, to provide coverage of Obamacare to people who are poor has not happened because the good religious nationalists oppose it. I happen to believe that the highest and the best future for this nation and its role in the world lies in us holding fast to what I call prophetic citizenship, despite the dystopian mindset of Christian nationalism that challenges the core beliefs in justice and inclusion and freedom in the society. And I borrowed the title, I borrowed the words fierce urgency in my book from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who often spoke about what he called the fierce urgency of now. I am on a college campus, and so I can talk to you as adults. Can I? A year to the day before he was assassinated, April 4, 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. publicly defined the war in Vietnam as a civil rights issue in his address at Riverside Church titled Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. And he uttered the following pressing statement, quote, I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society, where machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. There is nothing except a tragic death wish to prevent us from reordering our cards so that the pursuit of peace will take precedence over the pursuit of war." End quote. I should tell you that public reaction to Dr. King's message was swift and hostile. A number of editorial writers attacked him for connecting Vietnam to the Civil Rights Movement. The New York Times issued an editorial claiming that Dr. King had damaged the peace movement as well as the Civil Rights Movement. Life magazine assailed the speech as, quote, demagogic slander that sounded like a script for Radio Hanoi, close quote. The Pittsburgh Courier, an African-American publication charged King with, quote, tragically misleading, close quote, black people. And at the White House, President Lyndon Johnson was quoted as saying, this is a quote, and President Johnson was known for being rather colorful in his speech. <laughs> quote, what is that goddamn nigger preacher doing to me? We gave him the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We gave him the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We gave him the War on Poverty. What more does he want? Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, a year after he delivered this speech that was written by Dr. Vincent Harding. And despite the hostile reaction to the speech, neither Dr. King nor Dr. Harding disavowed it. But Dr. Harding, who passed away in 2014, always believed that that speech was the reason King was murdered. Dr. Harding said in a 2010 interview, quote, it was precisely one year to the day after this speech that that bullet which had been chasing him for a long time, finally caught up with him. And I'm convinced that that bullet had something to do with that speech. And over the years, that's been quite a struggle for me. Close quote. <clears throat> of course, now, Dr. King's name is venerated. There are traffic arteries named in him. There's a statue to him in Washington, D.C. There's a national holiday honoring his birth. He's revered across the world as one of the most prophetic souls of the 20th century, if not the modern era. When President Obama took the Oak office to begin his second term, he placed his hand on a Bible that belonged to Dr. King and alluded to him during his inaugural address. The question, however, is notice the distinction between the religious nationalism of the people I identified earlier and the worldview of Martin King. 
and notice the differences that that distinctive difference means for the issue of bureaucracy. The veneration of Dr. King has not included any significant or serious effort by U.S. policymakers or social commentators and moral leaders to include religious leaders to embrace the radical revolution of values that Dr. King championed. The giant triplets that Dr. King mentioned of racism, materialism, and militarism have not been confronted. Note, the U.S. currently devotes more of its budget to national defense and homeland security than to educating children, fighting disease, feeding the hungry, and alleviating poverty combined. The recent tax cut championed by the Trump administration and the way so many politicians genuflect to the wish of the gun lobby despite evidence of gun violence are two vivid examples of this reality. We may never know the true financial cost of the tragic misadventure known as the war in Iraq. Yes, I am a military veteran. I am an honored military veteran. I am a from a long line of men on my family who are veterans. The men on my father's side of the family who have served in the military um, first degree since World War I. But from the 10th anniversary of the war in Iraq approach, Reuters reported on a study by a team of active missions that tallied the cost of the war at 1.7 trillion a figure that did not include 490 billion owed to Iraqi war veterans for disability benefits. These are U.S. veterans of the Iraq War that's owed almost half billion dollars, no, half trillion dollars, almost half trillion dollars for disability benefits. The study projected that expenses related to the war in Iraq could go to more than six trillion over the next four decades. We're still looking, still looking for the weapons of mass destruction. At the same time that U.S. leaders, including religious and civic leaders, venerate Dr. King's memory, they have ignored or rejected his call for the U.S. to use its wealth and its prestige to lead the world in radical revolution of values that rejects war as the preferred, preferred means of resolving disputes. Although President Obama could not persuade U.S. officials and global allies to embrace a military response to Syria, the way President George Bush did concerning Iraq, U.S. militarism continued during the Obama administration, just as it did under the Bush administration. In 2012, Dr. Dr. Jonathan Tran issued an essay about the war policies of the, of the Obama administration and reminded us that President Obama has articulated what Tran termed a Oh, theology of war. I don't know if anybody paid attention, but it's sadly ironic that the first African American to hold the office of president endorsed the policy of killing American citizens by using armed drones. President Obama had more American citizens killed using drones than President Bush did. Please remember that it was during the Obama administration that Edward Snowden was vilified. Why? Because he happened to tell us the truth. That our government actually was spying on us. And during the Obama administration, it was President Obama who called Edward Snowden a threat as if truth-telling somehow is a threat to freedom. By the way, we're not only spying on us, we're spying on our allies. <laughs> Forty-four years after Dr. King was murdered by a gunman, the nation witnessed the massacre of 20 children and six adult staff members at Sandy Hill Elementary School. Of course, Sandy Hill has almost been, been forgotten because now we're talking about Parkland. <coughs> where 17 more students were killed in Florida last month. The militarism that drives U.S. global policy seems to now turn on our children. But the response to Sandy Hook and other school massacres, massacres has not been to confront the giant militarism that I came talk about. Remember the triplets? 
racism, militarism, and materialism, which are all embraced by religious nationalism. Firearm manufacturers and their lobbyists, like defense contractors and their lobbyists, now hold more influence than ever. Sadly, devotion to corporate profit making continues to hamstring efforts to make our society and the world more safe. And thus we have seen materialism join forces with militarism, so much so that American schools now run the risk of being turned into fortresses. I push you by hardening schools. Hello. I've been in the military. A hardened facility is a fortress. When we talk about hardening facilities, what you talk about hardening is you make it a bunker. You're turning a, a classroom into a bunker. We somehow are blind to the moral, stark, and ethical contradiction of singing, let there be peace on earth while arming school teachers and cheering people who openly brandish handguns and assault rifles. And by the way, for those of you who may have missed it, read today's New York Times. There is an op-ed piece by Associate Justice John Paul Stevens, retired of the U.S. Supreme Court, who says it's time to repeal the Second Amendment. Now, I know that's a dangerous thing to say in Arkansas. <laughs> uh, I am a, I am a card-carrying, concealed weapon carrier, okay? And, and I tell people, when I get stopped, I have to hand my concealed weapons card and my driver's license. And the officer asks you, where are you going? And I say, which ones? <laughs> But I think we need to have a reality check about the Second Amendment. This is college, right? Yeah, it is. Do you, do you, did you, have you read the Second Amendment? Okay. You do understand the Second Amendment was designed to protect the states from the federal government. It was not designed to guarantee everybody a gun. It was designed to make sure that the state governments would not be threatened by a standing army. Now, lest we be mistaken, most of us have National Guards people who swore to be in the National Guard because they want to be in the National Army, the standing army. So, Chief Justice Warren Berger, who was no flaming liberal, was right when he said, the talk about the Second Amendment is the biggest legal fraud we have seen. And that was his word. And it is fraud, okay? It is fraud. Because quite honestly, no self-respecting deer hunter goes hunting with an AR-15. Okay? Or with any of the handguns I have. I'm a discharged veteran, which means I'm licensed to kill, trained to kill, taught to kill, learned to kill. I was an artillery officer, that means I learned how to kill big numbers. You don't go hunting with anything I was trained in in the army. So I don't need to have the Second Amendment. To hunt squirrels, <laughs> rabbits, deer, elk, bear. I need an AR-15 to hunt people. Because none of the deer ever shot back. You know, you know, you you take an AR-15 into a zone because it has a firing capacity to allow you to repel force and to suppress oncoming force. The reason it has an automatic switch on it is because you have a power to send out enough bullets to keep whoever's shooting at you with their head down. Every time I went hunting, the rabbits were not shooting at me. The squirrels were not shooting at me. The raccoons were not shooting at me. The deer were not shooting at me. Bambi's Relatives do not shoot back. <laughs> okay? If you're worried about the Second Amendment, think about Thumper. <laughs> think about Thumper. And remember, you don't need your shotgun 
to have a bump stock to kill Bumper. <laughs> Get real. I'm, I, st I still got my cards, okay? I got my card here. I got my kids concealed carry card on it. But I need people to understand that militarism and materialism sanctified by religious nationalism are driving our notion of democracy. And now our children are paying for it with their lives. And we actually, I'm in trouble now, I'm in trouble. I am in Johnson County. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that, you know, we have teachers on to but I remember I did not want many of my teachers to have a belt, let alone a gun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I mean, get, get real. <laughs> the people who complain about corporal punishment to children want to give guns to the people they don't want to have their children spent by. Get real. Mm -hmm. Now, as doctors, as Mr. Spock would say on Star Trek, fascinating. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> what we have not come to realize is that thanks to this notion of militarism, we have now turned our schools into fortunes and we have turned the whole notion of public safety into public occupation. Because in some community, law enforcement are seen as occupiers as opposed to peacekeepers. Speak his name, Stefan Clark. Anybody remember that name? Stefan Clark. Sacramento. California, Stefan Clark, 22-year-old black man, killed last weekend, shot 20 times in his grandmother's backyard with his hands up, unarmed, holding his cell phone. Watch the video. Don't turn your eyes away, watch the video, and then watch it with a timer. After Stefan Clark is shot down, five minutes go by before any medical attention is called for him. And so we take Sandy Hook, and we take Michael Brown and Ferguson, and we take Eric Garner and Stratton Allen, and we take Sandra Bland in Houston, <coughs> and we take Philandro Castile in Minneapolis, and Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, and Stefan Clark in Sacramento, and we realize that more black brown and poor white people have been killed this year by the police who are unarmed and have been killed in all of the school shootings this year. Religious nationalism. Militarism. Materialism. Because remember, It's the gun lobby that drives this. I am mindful that we haven't confronted the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism. Instead, we've added sexism, including homophobia and transphobia, classism, technocentrism, imperialism, and xenophobia to the mix. The giant triplets have now become octuplets. <laughs> and 
the painful truth is that political, commercial, and even religious leaders are comfortable bestowing platitudes on Dr. King's life and ministry 50 years after his assassination, while actively and deliberately disregarding his warnings and his call for us to turn away and embrace a, more, a radical revolution of values. Our leaders play on, I use a different word, I say they pimp Dr. King's moral authority for their own benefit at every opportunity. However, they question the relevancy of his teachings and warnings of our time. I did not put this in the manuscript because I did not know it at the time. I mentioned it to Chaplain Willoughby before um, because I, you know, I have one of these devices like you all have, you know, mobile devices. And I have email on it. I get email messages and I check these things times. And just before we were gathered, I checked my email and I got the email message. There it was. And I had a moment. I had a moment. I had to share this with you. It's real. I mean, I got an email message about a gathering plan for a vigil of the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. It's from the Martin Luther King Commission of Arkansas, inviting me and other faith leaders to a gathering on the steps of the state capitol midday commemorate Dr. King's life and ministry. And the keynote speaker will be Governor Ice Ashes, <laughs> who was a spokesperson for the NRA and was head of the DEA. Now you know why I say we play on, we pimp Dr. King's life and legacy. Can you envision Martin Luther King walking hand in hand with the NRA anyway? I mean, he was gone down, his mother was murdered in church as she sat at the organ. And we're going to have a spokesperson who was a spokesman from the NRA give the keynote address at a vigil commemorating his assassination? You know, I can hear on some level somebody going, WTF, what is this foolishness? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, there, there you go. This contradictory behavior amounts to what I call the re-assassination of Dr. King. Mm. Dr. King's ministry and his message is being re-murdered by drone warfare, by NSA surveillance, by a militarized law enforcement culture, by our support for regimes that use military force to oppress minority populations in this society and elsewhere around the world, as well as by the half-truths and the outright lies that are to defend those actions and uh, it's all done with the blessings of religious nationalism. Dr. King is being re-murdered by fiscal policies that promote corporate interests of investment bankers over the lives and fortunes of workers and homeowners and retirees and school children and needy people. Dr. King's dedication to attack and eliminate the causes of poverty is being reassessed by policies that widen the glaring income inequality gap between the super wealthy and the poor. His righteous indignation against injustice being re-murdered by the opponents of the so-called prosperity gospel. And that's a, a slight against not only white religion, it's a slight against black religion. It's a slight against the religion of Plecto Dollar and T. D. Jakes, Joel Osteen, the like. And those who use religion as a weapon to deny civil rights to people who are lesbian or gay or bisexual or transgender or poor or immigrants or women or otherwise vulnerable. Dr. King's call for a radical revolution of values is murdered when he professed to honor his memory while bowing to the technocentrism responsible for poisoning community aquifers through fracking for natural gas. We read about that. I know I'm in the heart of fracking country. But you need to understand, environmental Toxins do not respect zip codes. They do not respect area codes. We should have learned that by now. 
When we honestly assess the mood and the conduct of U.S. leaders and the public at large, including religious leaders, says Dr. King was murdered in Memphis, it becomes clear that we have not embraced the radical revolution of values in particular. We haven't weakened the giant triplets of racism and militarism and materialism. We have nourished them, we've bred them, we've multiplied them. And the religious leaders who are like Dr. King, like my friend Reverend Jeremiah Wright in Chicago, like Father Michael Fletcher, like Jim Wallace, who have followed Dr. King's model of prophetic criticism, people like Bill Moyers, mm -hmm. have been rejected and condemned the same way that Dr. King was responded to by President Johnson, who cussed King as opposed to blessed him. Dr. King was correct when he said there's nothing except a tragic death wish to prevent us from reordering our priorities. One thing you gotta remember about a death wish, sooner or later, people who feed a death wish find a way to destroy themselves. And I would suggest to you that we may be seeing that. A society that feeds the system that shoots and kills people will eventually find a way to lionize killing people even that shouldn't be shot. We're putting the death dealing instruments in the places where we want to have our children safest. Fifty years later, it's clear that those evils haven't been corrected. At the risk of inviting your disappointment, if not your displeasure, I would like to suggest we're not living in a time that's any more divisive than the previous eras we've lived in. After all, humans have always managed to quarrel, <coughs> dishonor, and try to oppress each other. Every age has its candidates and its competitors for imperial supremacy. In every age, people have tried to steal or kill their way to dominance. In every age, new ideas have been met with doubts, derision, and attempts to dissuade people from holding them. And in every age, people who are strong have used their strength to oppress others who are vulnerable. In every age, immigrant people have been targeted for exploitation and persecution. And in every age, religion has been used as an agent for hating people we should love, and check this, claiming that hating people that way is proof that we love God. <laughs> we are not the first people to live in a time of intense racial and religious discord. Has there ever been a time when humans didn't argue or break fellowship or even wage war among themselves about notions of religion and beliefs about ethnic and ancestral identity. I, don't think so. I could mention other examples to illustrate that divisiveness is not new to this society or elsewhere for that matter. But you get the point. Ours is not the first era or the first place to witness divisiveness. We are the first, however, to witness so much divisiveness in real time, on a constant basis, that's validated by our religion. We're the first humans to live in an era when it's possible to know within minutes about tragedies that are around the world. And that makes us the first humans to be able to live knowing about tragedies affecting countless others, yet behave as if we do not care or cannot find the means to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And the question I'd like to leave you with is whether or not we realize the impact that has on our notion of democracy. Do we realize what that means? And how do we deal with it? Where do we find the strength to endure the suffering, let alone encourage those who suffer? How do we deal with our own sense of inadequacy, the painful lessons of our time and place of crisis and cruelty and timidity and even in mendacity that cause so many people to distrust hope and disavow faith and even distance themselves from the community, even question whether or not democracy can survive? Let me offer a couple of suggestions, and then I'll take your questions. I should add that my suggestions are not original. There are insights from two black theologians. 
Howard Thurman, the African American mystic that I quoted earlier, who inspired Samuel DeWitt Proctor, who was Jesse Jackson's college president, and Jeremiah Wright's seminary professor, and Martin Luther King's uh, teacher in Morehouse, and Alan Busak. Alan Busak is a South African theologian who labored alongside Desmond Tutu in the anti apartheid By the way, this is a plug, a shameless plug that they had. Alan Busak will be in Arkansas this weekend preaching at New Millennium Church on Sunday for Easter and lecturing this Saturday at 3 o'clock. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Writing in an inward journey, Howard Thurman makes the following observation. Quote, we keep a troubled bed ver a, we keep a troubled vigil at the bedside of the world. We cannot accept the sickness as unto death, but we cannot grasp the meaning and the hope of a cure that will make life all about us pale and well. The contemplation of the world's destruction at our hands confronts even our little lives and their little part with a guilt too vast to assuage and too overwhelming to manage. Thus, we clutch the moment of intimacy and worship when we become momentarily a part of a larger whole, a fleeting strength, which we pit against the darkness and the dread of other times. Close quote. I quote that to remind us that we often are called who believe in hope, who believe in democracy, often called to speak up for the unheard, to show up for the overlooked. We need to remember that we are part of a larger whole. We are, it's not all about us. We're not in this by ourselves. Please do not lose heart. There are more people that are holding on to hope than you think. God is up to a whole lot more than it looks like. And I'd like to suggest to you that my maternal grandmother was right when she would say that God is up to something. <laughs> God is up to something no matter how much we see how bad things are. And whenever your strength or your insight or your hope seems inadequate, remember that God's up to a whole lot more than we see. And sometimes we need to remember that God has a very, God has a very profound sense of humor. I, 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 I know I tread on very, very dangerous ground in Arkansas. But I am an Arkansan. I like to remind people that you would not have humor but for God. But because if anybody has some humor, God does. That was part of my sermon that Sunday, but it's not an issue. I move quickly to a deal with the stirring rope stirring rose from Alan Busak. Alan Busak's latest book, and the one he's going to lecture on Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock in the Millennium Church, is <laughs> <laughs> titled Pharaohs on Both Sides of the Blood of Red Waters. Pharaohs on Both Sides of the Blood of Red Waters. At chapter 2 of that book, Busak calls for prophetic people to not be afraid to speak a different language concerning what he and Pope Francis have termed the, quote, globalization of indifference, close quote. Buzak joins Pope Francis in calling on prophetic people to, quote, not be afraid to speak a different language about human suffering, and he uses these words, quote, we are in no position to offer comfort, compassion, and justice to adjust to a suffering, bleeding humanity, overwhelmed by a petrifying indifference. If we do not believe that there is good news they should hear and we cannot speak a language of hope and resilience, of resistance and redemption, if we do not unlearn the language of imperial compliance, of domination and subjugation, of carelessness and indifference, of diplomatic evasion, we are no longer in a position to deny that the Pope is right. Something is wrong and it is more wrong today than 10 or 20 years ago. The time has come for us not to be afraid to say it. I'm not talking about simply mentioning, enumerating, or bemoaning the wrongs we see. To not be afraid to say it has everything to do with how we say it. Do we say it with truth, with courage, with compassion, and with faithfulness to those who suffer? The wrongs we see are not just happening, they are caused to happen. And they are happening to the vast majority of God's children who are vulnerable, targeted, and excluded from human consideration. They are not happening randomly. They are deeply systemic, deliberately built into systems of oppression, domination, and decriminalization, 
And we must not be afraid to say it. We must not only break the silence, we must speak a different language. Our language must be a courageous, liberating, transformative, healing, inclusive language. We should learn to resist the temptation to see the global realities through the eyes of the powerful and the privileged, but rather through the eyes of suffering, the weak and the vulnerable, the dehumanized and demonized, the outcasts and the excluded. We must be much more alert in our awareness that our global reality is an imperial reality. Empires not only create realities of domination and subjugation, they also create myths of invincibility, endless power, infinite duration, great beneficence, and, in, and divine incarnation. Crucial to all these is what Walter Wink calls the myth of redemptive violence. Instead of acknowledging the violence of users because it is needed for continued domination, subjugation, exploitation, the empire enshrines the belief that violence saves, that war makes peace, that might makes right. Consequently, violence is not only necessary, it is the only thing that works. Close, close. Is it just me? That sounds like truth. That sounds like truth. That sounds like truth. The myth of redemptive violence is why we actually have people having serious conversations about putting guns in schools. It is why we actually have people talking about having a first strike, not capacity, but a first strike willingness to use nuclear weapons. And so the issue for us is whether we are going to speak of hope and think of that as an alternative to the octopus, racism, militarism, materialism, imperialism, classism, technocentrism. You with me so far? Sexism, which includes homophobia and transphobia. You with me so far? Xenophobia, fear of strangers. Hello? Oppressive capitalism. I suggest to you that if we don't confront the relationship between all of those isms and religious and nationalism, we, will, we have not connected the dots. That is a challenge for us in the 21st century. And in respect for it, I think that the future of our democracy will turn for the minute. Thank you for giving me patience while I try to share these remarks. I'll now take any questions you may have. Personal recorder on, and so if a member of our church who told me to record this <laughs> this uh, lecture is going to be mad at me. And, and, and Levante, you messed up because you're supposed to remind me to turn my recorder on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell I'm going to tell Sister Cindy that you did not prompt the the, the, the absent-minded preacher. We got you covered. You know what, I am not going down by myself, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I am going bubbly bubbly, but I'm carrying you with me. <laughs> Are there questions, comments? This is a, yes, yes, Levante, you can't start. <laughs> I want to exercise the power of the speaker and say, you cannot start, because I know you, I know you, I know you. Besides, you have my numbers. You can call me, you can text me, you can email me, but you have to come in the middle of the night. All right, somebody who doesn't know me well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get over it. 
<laughs> yes, questions, comments, yes. When did you first notice the change in Americans' attitude to the relationship between government and religion? Kind of developing what we're facing now. Can we talk? <laughs> <laughs> I think I became aware of it in the 70s. I became aware of it in the 60s. Okay. I was born in 52. In the 60s, I noticed that the same folks who were maddest about civil rights had the biggest crosses in front of the churches. They had the biggest crosses. Now, if I hadn't, if, if I wanted, if I wanted at a University of Arts, and, and because you know, Levante knows that I am, I, I have a very free spirit, and I sometimes use language as colorful, and, <laughs> and, and so I will not use my big A language. But you know, I, I, I remember seeing these big A crosses in front of, uh, in front of, in front of churches that said that they love God. Okay. But they had an issue with civil rights. I'm trying to figure this out. Okay, now, okay. And it, you know, I, I was a teenager at the time. And of course, nobody pays as a teenager. So, you know, my thoughts were not really paying attention to anybody. Now, you know, of course, I'm grown and I have a certain, a certain public persona. Folks pay attention when I say stuff. Uh, and so you plan to notice back then. I mean, can I drop some news on you? <laughs> Do you recall when every town of any good size that called itself a city had a YMCA? <laughs> what happened to the YMCA? What happened to the YWCA? When did the YMCA begin to go into? Do you recall what happened? The Ys integrated. And the family life centers began showing up in churches. Hello! <laughs> the big A churches began building family life centers. Because they good, holy white folks didn't want their little black children playing basketball with brown and black kids, which they would be doing at the Y. And so the YMCA, where you had people coming together, Parents brought their children to the Y to learn how to play basketball and football and become teammates and friends. I ten times double dog dare you to find a Y MCA in Johnson County. Where is it? Okay, Polk County. Where is it? Madison County. Where is it? Conway County. I've gone four counties, right? Faulkner County, five counties. How do you obliterate an entire movement that set up in the name of faith to nurture nobility in young people at the same time that you are having a building boom of family life centers financed by people who take in their tithe money and building that. Now, here's, I told you God has a sense of humor. Here's the joke. Ted Fitness. The children are the folks who went to the family life center, don't take their children to the 
Family Life Center. <laughs> they are members of Ten Fitness. Where everybody showing up. And guess what? The children, those children said, listen, we don't want to be part of your church either. <laughs> when we get married, we are not getting married at your church. Why? Because our gay friends can't show up, our Muslim friends can't show up, our LGBT friends can't show up. And so guess what? We will bury you out of your big gay church. <laughs> but we're not coming, no, no. You put your money there. But when you die, and your generation dies, we are not going to keep your big A church up just because you died in it. When we die, have I searched a funeral home? Aren't you seeing more search a funeral home? Hmm? When we have our wedding, we're in the chapel. Why? Because at the chapel, the preacher is not keeping our gay friends out. We don't have to have a vote of the congregation on whether or not my lesbian sisters can be in my bridal party. I noticed it back then. Now, here's the problem. I know I'm smart, but I'm not the only person with a brain. <laughs> The issue isn't that we haven't seen it. The issue is we don't want to call it by its right name. This is what religious nationalism has done to us. And the problem is that we will not call it by its name. Even now, people are mad at me because I call it. Okay. Next question. Yes, sir. Hello, Casey from Sutton. Hey, Casey, how you doing? Good, how are you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you just kind of touched on institutions that nurtured nobility and, and young, just students, not just students, but young people of color on the decline and being eradicated. So with that, in an ever-present news cycle where we're constantly being exposed to all the injustices that you just talked about, how do we resist apathy? And how do we continue to not be desensitized? Remember, remember being desensitized is a choice. It is an option, not a necessity. We feel by choice and we have the power to choose A, what we feel passionate about, B, what we're going to do with our passion and see what we're going to do and say because we have passion. I don't worry about 24 hour news cycle. I mean, we have 24 hour news cycle because technology makes it possible to do it in 2018 what could not be done in 1964. There were three channels in 1964 because that's the only technology we had, and there was no containment internet. Okay? One of the consequences of John Glenn circumnavigating the globe in space was it triggered us in space as age. And now you have satellites. Okay? CNN was possible because you could actually project information through the use of satellites. So I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem is if we turn our heads off about our power to choose. Because democracy is about choice. Remember the, that old movie? No. The American President. Mm -hmm. Michael Douglas. Mm -hmm. Plays the president. And he says in this, in this important line, you know, democracy is adult work. Mm -hmm. And I, my paraphrase on that is, chumps need not apply. Okay, I mean, you know, no. Chumps can't handle this. Now, if you want easy, you don't want democracy. Totalitarian rule is, is easy. The empire tells you what to think, the empire tells you what to do, you do it because the empire says it. Or you die. Or you suffer. Democracy says, hey, we have the power to think. 
We have the power to speak. We have the power to act. And our power is what makes us special. Our power to think and speak and act gives us the power to come together in redemptive ways as well as in oppressive ways. And we choose whether we use that power. And the challenge for the young people, because now my light's going down, my, I tell people, my star is sinking, your star is rising, my job is to clear the atmosphere so your star can rise easy. My business is not, is not to get in your way, but to try to block out the stuff that's getting you in your way as you rise. But my challenge to you is, please understand that rising is a choice. And if I can be a preacher for a moment, rising is a moral imperative. It is a moral obligation. If you have the power to rise, and you know that there is a need to rise, and you refuse to use your power to rise because there are oppressive forces in the atmosphere, you are engaging in what I call a hellish choice. Amen. You are choosing to use your power to be complacent and complicit with oppression as opposed to be an opponent. Now, again, you. Know, you know. <laughs> did I answer your question, sir? I'm sorry about that. You're trying not to embarrass me. I'm trying not to embarrass you. I'm just messing up. Yes, sir, and then yes, sir. You and then you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry to point you. I'm sorry. You referenced a number of scholars and theologians, but you didn't reference James Cone. I did reference James Cone when I talked about liberation. Yes. Uh, didn't mention him by name. Correct. Uh, James Cone from Arkansas, by the way. If you don't know James Cone, you need to know Dr. James Cone. James Cone from Bearden, Arkansas. Bearden, Arkansas. I think we miss, we miss that if you don't tell us who James Cone is. James Cone <laughs> is the father of black liberation theology. Black James Cone is the person who, and you need to read his latest book, by the way, which is called The Cross and the Lynch Institution. By the way, our congregation doesn't do Sunday school lessons. We, we read books, and the, uh, the reason we don't read Sunday lessons is because the preacher says, listen, you've been reading the same Sunday lesson all your life. You read the same Sunday lesson your parents read. If you don't know the Bible by now, help I help you. <laughs> the issue is you don't know the Bible. The issue is you don't know the truth about what the Bible means, and you have to have it unpacked. And so James Cone is a theologian from here in Arkansas who talks about the issue of liberation. And he upset a whole lot of folks. We came up with a black theology of liberation and said, God is black. And folks got all kind of upset. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought James Cone was talking about God being ethnically black. And James Cone said, no, you have to understand that God identifies with the oppression of people. And the whole understanding of the faith in Christianity is that you see God as being identified with the people who are oppressed. And guess who looks like the most oppressed folks in his experience? Black folks. Which means his latest book, The Cross Lynch Tree, says, you can't understand the crucifixion. He's the time coming. You can understand Lynch. Jesus was Lynch. Jesus was Lynch. Because you understand that on a crucifixion, you don't die from the holes in your hand. You die from suffocation. You literally choke to death. Because as your body is suspended, the weight of your upper frame forces down on your abdomen. And you have to spend more and more energy trying to breathe. And you eventually run out of energy. And slowly, you suffocate. Which is why some crucifixions lasted for days before people died because it took them that long to suffocate. The Romans loved, by the way, the Romans reserved crucifixion for two categories of people. You know what they were? Revolutionaries against the empire and escaped slaves. And that's why 
Combs, the cross legend tree is so profound. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Thank you very much. By the way, be careful, Dr. Combs. He's in, in, in very tough health. Very, very tough health. Uh, but uh, you want to read James Cone, and since you asked about that, thank you for suggesting that. You also want to read Cornell West. And I'm going to give you an assignment, students. <laughs> Mental note. And, and guess what? Everybody can use a student. Assignment. You want to read this book by Cornell West if you read no other. Title of the book. You, how many of you heard Cornell West's name before? All right. How many of you heard the West name Cornell West in the title Race Matters before? All right. Now I want you to read another book. It's titled Democracy Matters. How many of you read that book? Two people. You want to read Democracy Matters. The byline to the title of Democracy Matters is winning the fight against imperialism. Copyright 2004. 2004. And in 2004, Cornell West had already seen what we're seeing now. And unpacks it wonderfully well. Read it. Uh, yes, sir, your turn. Yes, uh, so. Forgive me for pointing at you. It's all right. It's completely okay. So, when you were 14 years old, uh, 1966, in Austin, Texas, there was a shooting there. Uh, there was a guy in the bell tower. Yeah. The people, like, uh, the police department tried to shoot the guys, uh, shoot the guy. But the people that also helped to work, the students, they used their guns from their dorms, their apartments, to actually help out with the police officers. So are you trying to tell that people should not have, like students should not have guns completely? No, why do you say that? Mm -hmm. Then, just re uh, not just recently, but there was also in Dallas, Texas, the whole police shooting. I was, in downtown Dallas, that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. I was playing ultimate frisbee with friends, and I'm hearing loud bangs. Yeah. What do you think a person in my situation, being just graduated from high school, should do in a situation like that? Surely, yeah. Drop and hide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, if you haven't figured it out already, you're not smart to be in college. <laughs> now let me explain why I say that, okay? You are, you're in, you are in college, and that's why I say that. Let me tell you why I say that. Anybody who says, I want to get my gun and go after them, let me remind you something. I am a military veteran, okay? The first rule of combat is friend or foe. I don't know who is a friend or foe if everybody's got a gun on your shot, gunshots. If you got a gun and I've heard gunshots, I don't know whether you are a shooter or not. And if you pull your gun out and I got a gun and I'm the cop trying to uh, apprehend the shooter, guess what? Before I go past you, I'm going to take you down. I am not going to go past you and have you behind me with a gun. Go to find somebody else. I don't care how long you got an NRA car. Because the first rule of combat is friend or foe. You know who your allies are. You know who you can trust. And if they don't come into the scenario with you, they are a foe. This has been the law of combat since they started fighting. Hello, I didn't bring it up. I didn't create it. So let's get real, real, real. If you bring your Glock 40 out, when you hear gunshot, the first responders are going to treat you and your Glock 40 as a threat. Unless you are wearing a uniform that has their 
law enforcement agency on it. They don't know how many shooters there are. They don't know who else is with them. They don't know how the threat arose. And it would be folly on their part to walk past you. And even worse, to enlist you. Because remember, I learned how to do this. You know, learning how to. People forget that when you go to the military, you not only learn how to kill people, you learn how to keep them getting killed. <laughs> and one way to keep them getting killed is not signing up with folks who can kill you. You don't walk up and this guy got a gun. I don't know who he is, but I like him. <laughs> There is a four, there is a, I'm sorry, son. <laughs> there is a six letter word for that. S T U P I D, stupid. <laughs> and in a combat situation, stupid means D E A D. I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. Gunfire. Uh, those of us who have been militarily trained know what's the first thing you do in an ambush? You run to fire. Why? Because if you don't run to fire, you are a target where you are. But if you are running to fire, you are running to fire with the purpose of engaging fire. You don't run to fire with nothing in your hands. I love everybody. I'm running to fire. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm running to fire to take you out. And when I run to fire, if I see you with a gun, guess what? Before I run past you, I'm going to take you down. Okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, it was a scary situation. Well, it is a scary situation. And that's why people should not treat it lightly. That's why we shouldn't put guns in places where unmilitarily trained people are. There's a reason why police officers have to go through training to identify whether or not they're engaging in a hostile force or a civilian. Because we don't, I mean, there are some businesses where, you, where, being, where being sometimes wrong isn't good enough. Excuse me, how many times have you gotten on a plane where the pilot said, well, we sometimes don't land the plane? <laughs> oh, no, no, okay. Uh, we have a few bad powers. We got a few bad apples. We got a few bad powers. Fly us anyway. Do you really get on those planes with Most of our pilots are good. But we're not going to tell you which one are. And by the way, we're going to let the ones who aren't good fly with the ones who are good and make you guess. Which ones you're riding with? Hello? That's what I call a boo-boo the fool kind of reason. <laughs> I borrowed that from Yogi Berra. You remember Yogi Berra? Yogi Berra? Who is Yogi's sidekick? Boo-boo. Why not call boo-boo the fool? Because everything Yogi said, boo-boo, thought was right. <laughs> And what did Boo Boo say about Yogi? Yogi is smarter than the average bear. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Boo Boo was a fool. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, next question. I'm, I, I guess I'm. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. President. I, I, I can't, Mr. President. <laughs> yes, Mr. President. Can I pass? <laughs> Good person get elected. 
The long version is if I accept, accept octuplets, how do we break it and get people who are willing to reject it actually elected? Good question. The short version of the answer is a good person can get elected if. Okay. That's all I'm A good person can get elected if the good person has an electorate that will think. It is an election. And elections outcomes are determined by who shows up and what the people who showed up think. You understand? If you have unthinking or wrong thinking people who show up and vote more than the people who think and think rightly show up, you can be as good as Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, and everybody else, and you won't get elected. Not because you're ungood, not because your boss aren't good, but because it's an election. And elections outcomes are defined by who shows up and what they think. Here's the deal. Part of the intentional result of religious nationalism has been to suppress voter interest and to destroy voter confidence. And we're seeing it in real time. Fake news. So why vote? Don't trust any of them. I always think, you know, uh, there's an old proverb. There's an old proverb. Iron sharpens iron. Great candidates occur because they are challenged by people to be great. Bad candidates happen because people don't challenge them in their badness. You have never seen any blade sharpened with a butter knife. I suggest we have a lot of bad government because we have butter knife candidates who are shopping themselves. And I don't care how hard you put a butter knife together, the most you can do is scratch it. You'll bend it. You won't shop it anything. It won't even really cut good at frozen butter. You have to throw the butter out. <laughs> you have to have iron shopping time. Uh, but the, what we have is, this is, this is intentional. I mean, nobody paid attention in 2000 when thousands, hundreds of thousands of votes were hidden, stolen, destroyed in Florida. It took, it took English newspapers, it took the Guardian newspaper and the BBC to expose that, and the rest of the U.S. population said, hold on, let's go on, let's, no, let's, let's have an inauguration. Don't, don't, don't make any noise, don't make any noise. Excuse me, if that had happened in, in South or Central America, we would have called that a stolen election. If it had happened in Africa, we'd call that a stolen election. We called it a peaceful transition. No, it wasn't. It was election fraud. Call things by their right names. If I break into your house and steal your stuff, you don't call that a peaceful transition to your stuff. <laughs> None of you got good sense. <laughs> And in a democracy, what is more precious than the vote? What is more precious than the vote? And we have 
whole communities that are having their books stolen. How can you not say it's stolen when you say the election is going to be on a day when it's not going to happen and you send that news to the people you don't want to vote? That's called fraud. How can you say it's not stolen when you cancel the voting precincts in the areas where the people who you don't want to vote vote? You call that theft. And how do you say anything but theft when you say the votes that were cast in those elections, we cannot find the voting boxes? Excuse me? We found Osama bin Laden in a cave. <laughs> and we can't find voting boxes in, in, in the US of A. Now, part of my problem is that I have reached sufficiently aged and I'm sufficiently crazy where I don't care what people think about me. <laughs> okay? And so I say stuff like this, all right? Which is why, you know, people, when people get mad at me, I say, okay, fine. I'm just, folks say, aren't you scared? No. I'm going to die one time, no matter how much I care for. I'm going to die one time, okay? I'm not going to die any more times, you're going to die. Right. One thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to act like I'm dead until I die. Here's what's the problem. We have people who are acting like they're dead before they die because they're afraid to be alive. They're afraid to think. They're afraid to speak up. They're afraid to speak out because they're afraid that if they think and they speak up and stand up, they're afraid that something will happen to them that causes them to feel like they will die. They will die to their jobs, or they'll die to their friends, or they'll die. You got no die for one time. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. But you can act David. Dropping something on you. You've been watching. The Walking Dead, but it wasn't on TV. You catch that? I just not said something. I just not said something. I just not said something. You've been watching The Walking Dead, but it wasn't on TV. You've been watching The Walking Dead in town, in the neighborhoods, afraid to act alive. Because afraid that your friends or your family or whatever are not going to treat you like you need to be treated in order for you to feel alive. And so you act dead. <laughs> Which is why the zombies are so entertaining. Mm -hmm. I need to die. It's been good being here. But I need to go back home so that my wife can have more of this unsolicited humor. <laughs> she doesn't appreciate it either. <laughs> Let me leave you with this though. First of all, thank you, Mr. President, for letting me come to your campus. I hope that I haven't made your job more difficult. <laughs> thank you, Captain Mooney, for letting me come to here. I hope that I haven't made you pray hard. Pray hard. Pray hard. And I hope you haven't, don't have to repent anything. I want to thank this community for embracing me and thank you for embracing my good friend and our church member, Levante. Y'all pray for Levante. <laughs> I'm praying Levante graduates. Okay. Because I know Levante's grandmother. Levante's grandmother will come up here. <laughs> some of us, some of us, Levante is not the only one who has family members like this. Some of us have family members like this, okay? We are more afraid of some family members than we are afraid of our teachers. Some of us remember, you know, our family members don't let me have to go to school. And he is more afraid of grandma. Sister Verley. And so you pray for Levante. Because if he does not graduate on May 17th, 
Jesus will not be able to save, save him. <laughs> Sister Berlin, I'm telling you the truth. She will get up off of her oxygen and walk up to him and come and beat the living hell out of her. <laughs> Thank you very much. God bless you.